Hello everybody and welcome to this week's episode of the Sleep Nanny podcast. So today I'm joined by Emily Adams. Emily was an early years teacher. She taught primary right through to year six and she now teaches and sleep consults. So she has a great position to talk about all the different things that come up when it comes to teaching, going back to teaching or not after maternity. We're going to talk about all of these things in this episode. So Emily, I'm really warm welcome to the podcast thank you you're welcome so just just so our listeners know a bit more about you um emily to start with just take us through that journey like um your your teaching journey really in sort of like the quick fire mode of like where you've where you've come over the past decade yeah so i uh left school went to university uh specialized in education and early childhood studies because Right from when I was at school, I wanted to be a teacher. That's all I ever wanted to do. And I was on that path to become a teacher and that was it. (laughs) There was no straying from that really. And yeah, I taught for 10 years across a variety of age groups from early years right up to year six. Um, Absolutely loved it. Never thought there would be a day where I would consider coming out of teaching um it was when I had my little girl winter who's now three where um you know things started to change um so yeah um yeah so talk us through that that shift because I love that you loved it right you loved what you did and that's actually such a privilege so many people don't enjoy their work so you loved what you did you couldn't really see how it would ever be any different um what shifted for you when it came to having your first child? What what was different? I think with teaching, um, you have to really, really enjoy it because mm. there's so much when it comes to teaching. There's so much work you have to do, so much planning, preparation. You've got to love it because you do take work home. And before having a child, that was that was okay. I loved what I did. I had all the time in the world. It was fine. And then when you have a baby, your priorities change. Hmm. And, you know, I was on maternity leave and I started thinking, well, how am I going to be the teacher that I was? before having a child because now I've got this little person mm-hmm. when am I going to do all that extra stuff involved in teaching and yeah it dawned on me that actually is this the right thing for me to be doing you mm-hmm. know you you I mean one of the reasons why I did go into it um is because you go into it thinking it's a great job for um family life you yeah. think oh, I get all the holidays I'll be off when my children are off I'll get the weekends and things like that yeah but actually in reality it doesn't fit around family life at all and definitely that's what I found yeah. um because it's long days it's long hours um and if you're a full-time teacher with a family you ha- you have to accept that you will miss out on things you'll miss dropping your child off at school every day and picking them up um, mm. you'll miss potentially sports days, nativities, you know, things that are really important because there is no flexibility. You can't book days off when you're a teacher because you have all the holidays. Mm. <laughs> and actually, you know, I, I was getting really resentful of that, that people said, mm-hmm. oh, you know, stop moaning, you've got all the holidays, when actually you end up working through those holidays and that you're so rigid as a teacher that you can't book a single day off even, you know, if a wedding came up or an important family birthday and you wanted a day off, you cannot book days off. Mm. And that rigidity, Mm -hmm. um, I didn't like. Um, Understandably, understandably. And I think you're absolutely right because I... I used to think um, before I met so many teachers and I'm sure lots of people do have that belief which is what a great career to go into and especially you know you said that from school you were at school and you thought that's where I'm that's what I'm going to do that's going to be my path I know loads of girls I went to school with um, thought the same and people sometimes said to me you should go into teaching Um, there is that belief of having the school holidays off working school hours that feels 
like it's less than nine to five. But um, as you've said, and lots of teachers I know we've spoken to as well would agree that it's probably more than nine to five. It's, you know, you start earlier, you ultimately will finish later and end up taking it home with you as well. Um, and the, that, I guess, illusion of the nine to five, sure, you might get that chunk of time off in certain school holidays, but you almost you're not going to get that anywhere else in the calendar year. So, yeah, I, I think lots of people probably don't realize that. No. About teaching no. generally. Mm. So with that, then you're having a child probably brought this to the forefront of your mind even more. Right. So you had winter, you kind of reevaluated and went, OK, well, what do I do? And for someone who had only ever seen her path as teaching, um how did that feel for you like what 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 were you you know what went through your mind as to well, where do I go next like what were you thinking yeah I, I I was lost really I didn't know what to do because when I apply myself to something I apply myself 100% yeah um and before having a baby that was my work I was a, yeah. a teacher and that was my identity mm. and then you have a child and all of a sudden, your identity changes, you're now a mom and a teacher, and mm -hmm. it's navigating that that was really difficult. I wanted to put 100% into being a mom, the best mm. mom I could be, and yeah. I wanted to be, you know, put 100% into my work like I always had done. Yeah. So I did make the decision to go back part time, and I went back two days a week as a teacher. Yeah. And before starting back, I thought, this is a win win. This yeah. is a win-win. I can, you know, be there 100% of the time for my daughter. Yeah. And then when I was at work, I'd apply myself 100% there. Yeah. But actually, I had guilt from both sides because oh, okay. I felt guilty that for two days of the week, she would have really long days in nursery. And she mm. really, really struggled with that for a mm. good two and a half years. We'd have her screaming going into mm. nursery. So I felt the guilt on that end. But also being a part-time teacher, yes, you're not in as many days, but you've still got the responsibility of a whole class. And I felt like I wasn't, I wasn't giving, I was giving 100% on the days that I was there, but I wasn't mm -hmm. giving 100% to my job fully because mm -hmm. I wasn't doing that full role. Yeah. So I had a lot of guilt when I was working part-time. Because I, mm. I went into it with all good intentions that this is going to be right for me. Yeah. But, you know, I'm greedy. I want it all. And everyone says to me, you know, you can't have it all, Emily. But I want it all. I'm greedy. Yeah. I want to be 100% more. But I also want to be, yeah. you know, um, ambitious and yeah you know succeed in a, in my career I want you both can. <laughs> and you can I 100% believe that you can and in to that extent you can have it all but it's about how you carve that out in a way that fits and I hear you because that feeling of you know it's almost like a bit of a disalignment like you felt guilty instead of it being a win-win it actually ended up probably being a lose-lose like yeah. no matter what I do I'm gonna feel bad I feel bad if I'm not fully here or fully there um and yeah that's that's never yeah never a good place to be so what so what shift did you make with that when you realized that mm, okay I can't really be fully in with this class is that when you changed the role of two days of teaching to supply yeah so um yeah yeah so at the end of last year I decided to leave my role um, at a school that I'd been at for eight years I was so happy there never thought I'd ever leave <laughs> um, but I did to take on supply teaching yeah which is much better the hours are much better because um, it's focused around the delivery between nine and sort of half past three yeah. but then I wasn't taking home everything else all the yeah. roles and responsibilities that come along with teaching so yeah. it's definitely a lot more manageable and yeah. actually a lot more enjoyable um, yeah I can imagine all the things going on you yeah. can actually I, I'm, I'm back to being a, a really happy teacher because yeah. um, I don't have the stress of everything else and I can be a better mom because I'm in a better place mentally 
Yeah. Yeah. Great. And I think like you say, you get to go and then do what you do well, really well and teach and feel that fulfillment of, of that thing that you have in you, but then you can step away and the actual class are not your responsibility beyond the hours you're there to teach them and yeah and and provide that service so I think that's um a really lovely balance and I'm, I'm sure there will be lots of teachers thinking yeah if only we could all have it like that but um it's great that you found that and made that fit for you and that was around the same time as becoming a sleep consultant as well am I right yeah part of my um, decision to do supply teaching was to train to be a sleep coach as well yeah um so yeah that's exactly what I did love that you get the best of both worlds now and create more balance and I think you know from in our community um so for our listeners sake Emily is one of our franchisees at the sleep nanny and we she's not the only one that's come into this from teaching um we find teachers to be excellent sleep consultants because they transfer the teaching element because when you're imparting knowledge to parents you're sharing that wisdom in teaching and explaining how this works how sleep works how the well this is the other part the child development part and how um as a little one grows how they process things differently and their learning um and and taking on that sort of information so you're having worked in early years and primary education um understanding of child development along with teaching as a sleep consultant you then are teaching adults but with a knowledge that is in, you know already got that baseline in the, the child development and learning sort of cycle so we find it to be really really transferable and as you, as i'm sure you you have too I think the missing link usually is business and the fact that as a teacher, most teachers don't have a business, haven't run a business of their own before. I'm like, well, hold on a second. I can definitely bring that to the table, the teaching, but what about this business stuff? And I think, I, I mean, personally, that's why I love the franchise model because you don't need to know all of that stuff. You've kind of got it blueprinted and, and packaged up in a process that works. And then you just need to follow that and, and partake in that. Um, Currently, you're doing both, aren't you? And and balancing uh, your business with the supply teaching. And um, do you enjoy that? Do you enjoy having a bit of bit of both going on? Yeah, I enjoy the flexibility, a hundred percent. And um, I'm due to have a baby in August. Yeah. Um, and what's been great is if I've got an appointment that I've got to go to, you know, I I'm not committed to do supply. Yeah, if there's a baby group I want to attend and do a drop in session as part of the business, then I can just not do supply and go and do that instead. So for yeah. me, it's the freedom and the flexibility. Yeah. And that is so important to me because my goal ultimately by the time winter goes to school in just under 18 months time is I want to be the person who drops her off at school at quarter to nine and picks her up at quarter past three. That is my yeah ultimate goal <laughs> yeah and to have um, the school holidays to be around like as it. was probably the original vision anyway right <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah but Amazing. yeah but also have something for myself yeah so this is why I've, I've chosen to do this and go on this journey um yeah. because it gives me the the flexibility but I've I've still got something mm -hmm. for myself I've still got that career yeah and something that puts your strengths into action. I think that as human beings, one of our one of our needs, one of our six core human needs is growth and to learn and to grow. And, you know, if we don't, if we kind of just plateau and we're not growing, it just doesn't feel very fulfilling. And the other one, one of them is contribution. And we forget that, you know, that sort of, whether that's contributing to society, whether it's contributing through our work, like it's another one of our needs that we can neglect. And um, I think as mums, we can be the best, you could, you could set about being the best mum in the world. And, you know, hats off to anyone that listens to this, that is like, they are a full-time mum because that is a full-time high demanding job anyway. And so I'm not for one second suggesting otherwise, but if that consumes you, but you feel that you've got gifts and strengths and talents inside of you that you're not 
using mm-hmm. because you've mm-hmm. devoted every part of you to being that amazing mom that can leave you feeling a little bit of a lack of fulfillment you can feel that like oh, there's, there's this niggling thing that I need to do and you can do both you can be an amazing parent and feel fulfilled in your own like who you are and what you're about so teachers that are listening to this like what what would you what are your thoughts around so somebody like you who maybe they were they could be on maternity leave right now um maybe they're expecting their second or maybe it's their first um or they're just sort of planning ahead and thinking well do I want to go back to teaching or oh my gosh yes Emily's been through exactly what I'm facing right now like what do I do or you know what are your thoughts around that because people will listen to you and think yeah this really resonates I think when you're a teacher I think well I definitely felt like I was trapped in that role Mm. because I thought what else can I do you know Mm. I've devoted my life to becoming a teacher what else Mm. is there that you know is going to give me that flexibility but using the skills that I've already got yeah and it was when I think the light bulb moment for me was when we reached out to a a sleep coach ourselves yeah um we had somebody from the sleep nanny actually who coached us because we really struggled with winter sleep when I went back to work in particular yeah Um, we reached out to somebody when winter was 13 and a half months old and yeah we went through the process and I found myself um really getting into it actually um you know every every step of the way every single day I would write things down I would monitor her progress I would assess what was working assess what wasn't working what can I do here and I was so reflective and that came across to the coach yeah and the coach at the time said you'd make an amazing sleep coach because you all the teacher skills were there and I was doing it myself yeah um and yeah for me I thought yeah maybe maybe I could look into coaching because the skills there really do marry up with teaching yeah um from you know if you think about a a sleep coach now you have that initial assessment and Mm -hmm. that's when you're identifying your strengths and weaknesses of a current situation that's exactly what a teacher does when you you get you get your new class or you start a new topic you are you do your initial assessment um, to see what's going wrong, where the gaps are. That's exactly what you do as a sleep coach at the very beginning. And then before you even start planning your lessons, you look at your end goal. So if if you're a sleep coach, you're um, asking the family, okay, well, where do you want to get to? Where do you see yourself getting to in the next two weeks? And for a teacher, that is knowing a year group expectations, knowing where those learners have got to get to. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, from there, you're forming a plan, which is yeah. what teachers do. So you're splitting the learning down into manageable chunks mm. and supporting them all the way through it. In yeah. terms of delivery, so that's like your solution, you're telling parents, you're imparting that knowledge, you're imparting those skills yeah. to parents, and that's exactly the same as teach how teachers would teach in a classroom. Yeah. Um, you know, well, it's easier, it's actually easier as a coach because yeah. you're doing that to one family, one, yeah. you know, two parents, as opposed to a class of 30 plus children, and you yeah. don't have the distraction, you don't have the behavior management. Um, so actually, well, that's more, <laughs> more straightforward um, when you're coaching. Um, and then the most important part for optimal progress is the monitoring and assessment part. Yeah. where it's your regular contact so if that's in the classroom that is going around your classroom checking the children's understanding how can you move that learning forward are there any mistakes that are being made how can we stop those in their tracks and set them on the right path and for yeah. a coach it's that regular contact which gives parents it keeps them on that right path yeah. to making the progress and making sure that they're going in the right direction and that they feel absolutely supported. It's that coaching element for me 
that mm. where you see that progress yeah 100 percent. so in terms of all the skills as a teacher to yeah. a coach it's exactly the same yeah. it's, it's, it's probably easier as a coach yeah. <laughs> than a teacher to be honest and you um, can, you've got you can carve out your own working terms your own hours your price points your you know you start to then take in some more of the control um that then can fit around family I think any type of coaching really but with teaching in primary education you've got the added thing of the subject matter and the subject matter being infants and children and um, understanding how they work I think it adds that other uh, transferable layer I'll tell you something actually that we love as well from from my perspective is that teachers always make great students. Teachers are great at learning because you almost have that approach to learning in, in as a concept. You have a great approach to learning, whether you're the one delivering that learning or receiving the learning, your approach to it is so good. So that's why when you hired a sleep coach to help with your daughter's sleep, you know, you were a great recipient of that information you were a great student you listened you noted down you reflected you refined you um you implemented the, the work and, and learned um it's the same when somebody trains to be a sleep consultant they you know they go through that training and, and the teachers are just great they ask great questions they you know i i personally i love that because i think it just marries the whole thing up together so nicely so what if somebody's on the fence about whether or not to go back to teaching? Um, or, you know, I guess on the one hand, how how can they go back to teaching if that is what they want to do? And how can we reassure them that there is life after teaching if it's not what they want to do? I think there's lots of options out there for teachers. Mm. Um, I mean, there's there's so many groups out there on Facebook and social media about different, you know, avenues that teachers can go into mm -hmm. um, if you weren't sure, because it's a really hard job to go into after having a baby, mm. because when you're a teacher, you you have to be on your A game. And particularly for me, what I find difficult with the sleep deprivation there would be some nights where I didn't sleep at all <laughs> and I went into work and I had a class of 30 children and I thought how am I going to do this and if you're not on your A game they know <laughs> mm. they know and it's you have to be on the ball at all times and yeah. you're not just a teacher when you when you're teaching there's so many different elements you've got to yeah. be on the ball um so it was really really difficult um for me going back to teaching but for anybody else i mean everybody everybody's circumstances are different um but for a child if you've got a child that is struggling with sleep particularly um it, it is re a really difficult to career to go back into because there is just no flexibility with it mm -hmm. at all. Um, and, you know, when you're back at work, you're back at work and that's it. Um, mm -hmm. But there is, you know, other opportunities out there um, for teaching, um, you know, after being a teacher. Uh, coaching is one of those avenues mm -hmm. which, you know, it, it goes hand in hand with teaching. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so my advice to people that are teaching that are sort of on the fence as to whether to go back or not would be to just research it and speak mm. to other people. I met up with um, a couple of ex-teachers. Mm. They were sort of acquaintances and I reached out and said, can you meet me for a coffee? Mm. Um, <laughs> and they got me a hundred percent because they thought you know that they'd been there themselves mm. um, they'd all had their own children and then all of a sudden okay this is not working anymore mm. and you know they offered some really really great advice on on moving forward mm. um, so yeah reach out to people that have yeah. been in in your position basically and yeah. and see what else there is because you're not you're not stuck in teaching uh, there is other avenues out there. Mm. There is hope. 
there is hope you don't have to stay in that trap and I love that you spoke to people because it, you like you said everybody's circumstances are unique but by just you know you'll get people who will say well I'd, yeah I teach but I could actually I could actually stop working like maybe you've got you know, a partner that can cover the bills and you can be a stay-at-home parent but what if you're like yeah so I don't have to go back to teaching but I've got this burning desire to still do something that means something to me. Um, or you may have somebody who on the complete opposite side of that, where it's like, I absolutely need the income. I need to contribute the, you know, the um, income into the family home. And, you know, I think you're, you're saying, I guess what you're saying is you don't need to feel trapped. Like that's the only option. If that's all you've ever known. You know, there are ways of carving it out differently um, or diversifying and taking those skills into other things, which I think is, yeah, just a really important message, really important message. Yeah. I, I love how you've done, you kind of gone through the sleep training journey from both sides here, because from a teacher who hired a sleep consultant to help your family get better sleep to then identifying how that could become you to then moving into that and sort of straddling the teaching world and the you know, coaching consulting world. Um, you do offer a, a really great perspective of all angles there as some of our other ex teachers, sleep consultants do. Um, I'm sure you'd be more than happy if people wanted to send you a message and ask you about oh, your, absolutely. you know, yeah. your experience. So reach out. We'll put Emily's um, link in the in the show notes so you can reach out if you want to pick her brains. But definitely reach out to other teachers and understanding their journeys and their circumstances. And, and I think how... any teacher actually would say yeah. the reason why they do it, the reason why they're a teacher is because it's so rewarding. Yeah. But what I found with coaching is that it it's so much more rewarding the impact you have on families through being able to help them through mm. sleep deprivation. Yeah. And, you know, the impact that you have on a child in a classroom, they might not remember you in mm. you know, 20 years time when they grow up, but I know we will always remember the sleep coach that we had when yeah. we were going through that. Mm. because it was so valuable to us and we can't mm -hmm. thank her enough for getting us through that and as a coach now doing the same for other families that mm. feeling of it's just so rewarding mm. and, and it's, I love it so much I love that there's the that you say you get to work with people at a deeper level, right? You know, you can, you're there in a class with 30 kids and you may make an impact. I don't doubt that you make an impact and that it's rewarding, but it's at a certain level, but you get to go so much deeper when you're closer to a family and the, the impact's huge. And I think the ripple effect of that. So, you know, in, in situations with families, you potentially find that you, um, you can repair marriages you can you know or reignite relationships because they've been neglected due to exhaustion you yeah, can um, prevent accidents from exhaustion but more I think long term you get to help instill healthy sleep in a child from a young age meaning they're more likely to grow up healthier happier oh, yeah. and with better sleep for the long term and yeah. therefore more likely to then pass that on down to their children and so on. So it's almost like, I feel like we're like rewiring future yeah. generations through the individual families that we get to work with. Yeah. And what really opened my eyes mm. when we went through sleep coaching within mm. the two weeks that we were coached for, the difference in our daughter cognitively wow. was huge. She you could see it in that two weeks. Because she was having more sleep, she was getting better at sleeping. Mm. She absolutely took off. Where mm. I, I thought, I, I felt guilty that I hadn't done it sooner. Because I am an educator, I am a teacher, <laughs> you know? And mm. for me, it's all about, you know, it's all about that. It's the best interest of the child, yeah. making sure that they are healthy they're happy but they are developing and that's what I didn't realize I didn't realize how impactful good sleep was 
but it's we... the benefits of it are absolute and I don't think many people do know the benefits but from an ed- 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 uh, sorry <laughs> from an educational point of view yeah they absolutely thrive when they get the the, the sleep that they need if we don't I think because generally speaking we don't know what we don't know right so if you know we we look at our child and think they're fine they're doing great they're healthy they're you know we think that they are absolutely fine because we don't know what could be possible if we unlock that added layer of of healthy sleep and it then goes right through school you know we i've spoken to sort of just pre-gcse age children as well and they totally don't know that actually if I go to sleep and have good sleep I'm going to have better memory consolidation and perform better in exams like it's actually that simple but it's not well widely understood to be honest and I think I met him it's absolutely amazing that you could see that as a teacher who understands early years and primary children and development to see that in your own child in the space of two weeks an uplift in her cognitive particularly her language wow really completely thrived wow Um, yeah so it really is amazing it really Mm. really is amazing the benefits Um, are just from an education point of view from a teacher Mm. point of view Mm. um, I love talking to families about this yeah and I love seeing the impact that that has on the child as a whole Mm. Um, it's really incredible And when you think about what that then unlocks, right? So I'm picturing now a bunch of reception age children in the classroom, a few loads of five-year-olds, and how many of them are exhausted? Yeah. How many of them are running around, um, behaviours coming up from a place of being really tired and depleted, Mm -hmm. health problems, sick days, all these other things that come up. But actually, imagine if they were all getting optimal sleep, you know? There's no perfect... They shouldn't all be identical, but their optimal sleep, optimal sleep for each individual child. Can you imagine what a different class you'd be looking at, a different experience that teacher would have? And it would be much calmer. Yeah, I can, yeah, I can picture it. But also just the performance. Like it would be really interesting to do an experiment on a class of you know even twenty kids and just see over the period of even two weeks would their reading age increase would their um you know speech and language skills just the things that we typically monitor at that age what what percent I'd really love to run that experiment (laughs) and what's interesting at reception age reception year one age Mm. because by this point they've dropped their nap Mm -hmm. a lot of children get 30 hours around that age or just before reception they get that 30 hours and you could have the best sleeper in the world really easygoing temperament they've slept well all the way up and then they hit three they've started getting their funded hours and then all of a sudden they're waking up in the night regularly because they're starting to get tired because they're in nursery this they're learning so much there's so many boundaries when they're in a setting Mm -hmm. and yeah it all just gets too much for them Mm. And parents don't realise how important sleep is. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, putting them to bed a little bit earlier when they do get their hours just to, you know, Mm. compensate for any overtiredness that might be happening. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, it's interesting how many parents do, do, you know, reach out and say, oh, my child's always slept well. Now, all of a sudden, they've got Mm. their funded hours or they're in reception and they're not sleeping great anymore. Yeah, and it's, it, again, it's that counterintuitive thing. I think there's two things that come to mind now. One being that it's understanding the hours awake aren't necessarily the same. It's about what's going on in those hours. So like you said, different environment. There's almost like a nervous energy, yes. um, a heightened level of learning, and, and that's actually more tiring than... Um, perhaps the days when they didn't do as much or they were with you or in that safe space there's a different level of emotional you know emotional energy is um, runs out faster when you're in that environment too and the other one is 
I, I hear this quite often where nursery key workers will go, oh, you get parents that complain and go, oh, no, you let them sleep or vice versa. A nursery person doesn't let a child sleep. And it's understanding when it is and when it isn't okay. Like I had somebody recently say to me, a nursery person saying they were they were getting in trouble with parents if they let their child um, have a little sleep in the afternoon. And the parents were like, no, no, they won't sleep tonight. And actually, the truth is, that child maybe needed that little sleep and it is okay in certain situations. If it's not too much and it's not too late, a small amount of sleep could potentially lead to a better night. And there's not, yeah, there's just not enough education out there about, about this um, and the difference that it can make. Yeah, yeah. huge. No, I, yeah, 100% agree. Mm. And that's why it's so good to be a part of the franchise yeah. because we're, you know, our brand culture is just, people are finding out about this and yeah, yeah having coaches now is becoming you hear of it more and more mm. um when I when well when, when winter was 13 months old and someone mm. mentioned it to me mm. I thought why hasn't anybody told me about this sooner I had no idea that there wow. were coaches out there but yeah. I think now, particularly with social media in the last sort of five years, yeah. it's getting so much better and more and more people are yeah. reaching out to, for help, which is amazing. Yeah, more the help. health benefits alone. I think that's crazy because I think where I've been in this world now for more than a decade, I've seen that go from when I had my kids and it was really yeah. an unknown. It was an unknown area. It was like... Well, I've heard of life coaches and business coaches, but sleep coaches, sleep consultants, what's that? Like, it there wasn't that many. Um, and over the years, because I've, I guess I've been immersed in this field, it, it's, it's you know, I, I'm too close to it. It's like when you haven't seen someone for ages and you see how much they've grown or whatever. I've not got the same perception on that growth. But when you say, you know, winter's only three and you've seen a difference in that time since you were looking... I think this I think it's a really positive thing that we're you know our our brand especially we're here to make a great big noise and shout about it and let the world know that you know there is support and you're not supposed to have all the answers you you know you you don't have all the expertise you wouldn't expect to go and do a tooth extraction or perform an operation on your child because you'd go to the experts for that and you know you don't need to know how to do everything um that support with sleep is and ought to be a very high priority um yeah. it is hard though because if you, when I when we were going through it and at every appointment every doctor's appointment any mid five appointment um I would say she's still not sleeping she's still and and it was just sort of laughed off mm, you know it was like it's just it, yeah you know, well, that's what it's like when yeah actually it's not but after going through it Doctors don't have the specialised knowledge. They don't. They're not sleep experts. No. And it would be great if the NHS could hire sleep experts because there is definitely a need mm. for it. But I think, yeah, it's that priority, isn't it? That mm-hmm. perception of is sleep a priority because there's not many. I think there are sleep um, clinics in the NHS. There are but, a few. But yeah. they're based around medical. They're heavily, emph- there's a bit of behavioural, but they're predominantly medical. And unless you have a medical sleep condition, you're not likely to get much help. And um, I, I've got, you know, I know family members and lots of people where they you know, they require that medical sleep support. It, it is different. And even, even back in the days when I trained, you know, the medical um, interventions or even a sleep study, being wired up, in a clinic to be studied is never going to give you the same um readings as in your natural sleep setting and we, we, as we know 94 95 percent of sleep problems in children are behavioral insomnia it's resolvable by behavioral intervention which is what we do um it doesn't require medication and it doesn't require a medical practitioner uh it, it requires a more of a holistic and yeah. behavioral approach so I think that's why it's not really incorporated in into that space and bless them a lot of them do a lot of great work but health visitors and midwives you know their knowledge 
but only go so far and there's no specific training in this space so you'll get very different answers if you ask a question from one to another because there's no standard training um yeah it's it's really important to have people that do what what you do and um i think you'll definitely have resonated with lots of listeners emily um today um i would love to invite them to contact you if somebody's listened to this and gone whether it's they want to talk about teaching and work or whether they're looking um to talk about their child sleep I feel like that lovely uh pay it forward effect you know you had the sleep consultant that helped you now you're a sleep consultant and you're helping families and so on and so on but you know if somebody's listening going she gets me I need to have that chat you offer a complimentary conversation don't you yeah absolutely absolutely I'm open to you know helping yeah. people out 100 percent yeah so book that call and have a chat with Emily and see how she could support you because it as she said she made that call once and it's changed literally changed their lives and I bet well you saw in two weeks the difference it made to your little girl and her you know her her life going forward is going to have impacted her so it's yeah absolutely amazing phenomenal. she's still in great habits she's over three and she still has her nap <laughs> which people can't believe <laughs> no but but she needs you know lots of them do still need it beyond three I think there's this common myth that they just drop the nap when they're two and I'm like no no they don't want to have a nap when they're no two two and a half that doesn't mean it's ready to go yet <laughs> they don't have all the answers at two <laughs> they don't know That's it. Um, <laughs> new baby coming along it's going to be a new dynamic yeah it is 100 <laughs> percent. you're gonna well of course you are but i know you'll be like instilling some really good rhythms and cues around sleep early on and That's i'm it. sure winter will be the big sister that that will help you out <laughs> yeah, yeah hopefully yeah she will <laughs> oh, exciting times well, well, we're really... up this time so yes yeah that's it yeah. and you know this is the thing in second baby you it could be a completely different scenario I know my two even though they were quite close in age totally different little human beings they needed totally different approaches um this is why is sleep a sleep solution isn't something you can just get from google or a friend because that person your friend who who hired a sleep consultant and had amazing results they can't just go well I'll tell you what we did because it might be different you know, yeah, a different and, answer. And, and that's what, you know, was just so amazing for us when we were going through it because we had um, so many friends with babies a similar age and mm. winter didn't sleep, but theirs did. And we were doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. Um, I remember going to the doctor saying, my baby is broken because <laughs> everybody else's child is sleeping, but mine isn't. Yeah, and the doctors had no answers for me. And that when it was when I got on the call mm. um, with a sleep coach, and they said, "No, no, your child's temperament is just so different mm -hmm. <laughs> to her peers. Mm. Um, she's just super high alert, um, and she is now. <laughs> yeah, she is now. She doesn't stop. Um, but but yeah. now she can put that to." great use you know she can put that brilliant alertness into thriving and Absolutely. unleash what she's made of rather than it hindering her because she's having a harder time settling to sleep than others and yeah yeah, yeah maybe two, I'm going to be looking out for everything I know all the signs all the signs um I wish I had prepared more um to be honest before going into it but when you know with first baby you're so overwhelmed I mean I did antenatal classes but they're very limited in terms of sleep locked on yeah. safe sleep yeah. um but other than that coping strategies and what to do if your baby won't be put down and things like that mm. um and sleep shaping what you can be doing from day one to help your baby you know aid yeah. them in good habits and things like that yeah. that would have been really helpful and yeah. my advice to anybody having a baby is yeah to um prioritize it equip yourself ahead Get of prepared yeah. yeah because you know there's sleep is the most common talked about topic when it comes to babies you know yeah. within the first five me minutes of meeting winter people would say well how is she sleeping yeah. there is a reason for that because it's a common common issue isn't it so and yeah, and sometimes prepared we don't always know that as well like I know first time round didn't even occur to me 
literally didn't occur to me I was probably really naive but the fact that my sleep was going to be disturbed didn't even occur to me um I think you know I was like oh yeah I suppose yeah that makes sense I didn't I hadn't thought about it but you know, we do the baby shows, don't we? And people are there and they're going to buy their push chair and they're going to get all their Tommy TP and they're going to equip themselves with all this stuff. But actually you would give up all of that stuff for a good night's sleep. Once you get into the parent part, you would literally say to anyone, like, take it all for free. All I want is sleep. You trade it all for sleep. And, um, it, it, I guess it's that message that, well, you can have that too. Like, you can Emily and our you know our in our organization we run newborn sleep courses and workshops there's so much access now to that knowledge but it's not just yeah okay you can get it in a book but it goes deeper and when you come to one of those you get to learn more about what to look out for um you get to ask questions and interact and I think that's um it's so so valuable to it like you say equip yourself with and it's not scary either like we don't go so here's all the doom and gloom about not sleeping like we're going to tell you how to manage it what the coping strategies are how you can manage it if you're a solo parent or if you have help how you can also take shifts and make this work and what to expect in at each week and at each stage and how to decode your little one's personality and their character traits so you know if you have got one that's not going to sleep so well or if you've got one that might be a bit easier and that there's different approaches like you can equip yourself with that before you're shattered <laughs> and yeah. um yeah yeah, definitely. Mm, that would be my biggest advice to anybody. <laughs> that is really good advice. <laughs> really, really good advice. Yeah, to be fair, it was after after number two that I got that help. Um so I was no better prepared the second time either, really. But yeah, you're ahead of the game. And so can our listeners be as well. Emily, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today and having this completely um, transparent conversation, real conversation, a real mum who has a business, who teaches and who's kind of walked that path. It's so valuable to hear from people like you and um, so grateful for you joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. So link to Emily in the show notes if you want to reach out to her. She is more than happy to chat with you. Thanks again for joining us for this episode and we'll see you soon.